launch data and simulation. So today we're very happy to have Professor Monzer Dali to give a talk on his view of RL. So uh, Professor Dali is a William Coolidge professor at MIT EUCS. He's also the founding director for the Institute of Data System and Society at MIT. So uh, Monzer has made a lot of uh, fundamental impacts across different domains, including finance, uh, power, um, I think transportation, and recently healthcare. And he's leading the COVID-19 emergency response group at MIT. Okay, so uh, uh, Munzer is, is uh, I think Munzer is at heart uh, a control theorist. So we're, we're going to hear uh, what's his view about RL as a control theorist. Thank you, Mengdi. Uh, well, uh, good morning, everybody. Or Good afternoon for us on the East Coast. Let me share my slides and um, should I share? Okay. Um, so I would like to make What's some comments. You're, still in, you're in presenter mode again. Am I? Let me uh, swap. Better? Yes. Perfect, okay. So um, thanks uh, Mengdi for the invitation. I'm uh, excited to speak to you today. So I wanna, yes, I think you're right. I am a control theorist. I see problems from the uh, perspective of control. And so I thought today what I'll do is I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the complexities that come up in learning stochastic dynamical systems, particularly uh, when there's a model misspecifications. And I wanna tell you, even though this actually is not directly re reinforcement learning or adaptation, I wanna wrap the reinforcement learning around this problem towards the end to tell you what, how one should be thinking about these types of problems. So I will make the connection to the, towards the end. So bear with me a little bit in terms of um, how we get there. Um, and I know I have 20 minutes, 25 minutes, Mingdi? 25. 25 minutes, okay. <laughs> uh, this work is, um, uh, done in collaboration with uh, my previous student who just graduated, Tohin Sarkar, and uh, my colleague, uh, Sasha Racklin. So the problem is uh, standard. We have, uh, we're learning a dynamical system and in, from input output data. So we think of the inputs as sequences uh, between uh, one to capital T. We apply them to a dynamical process <clears throat> and we observe noisy outputs. And the question is, can we learn this dynamical system? really a just sort of a fundamental system identification question. Um, and the, the real issue here is, well, what do we know already about the system that enable us to learn this dynamical system? Um, the class of systems I wanna look at is uh, stochastic switched linear systems. The, this is a follow-up work on earlier work that I talked about and also has already got published in the in GMLR where we dealt with the linear time invariant case. So now we're de dealing with a jump uh, system that I'll describe in a second. So what is the system described by? So we have a state space representation. X is a vector of dimension N, okay? And the, um, the state evolves as a, a, a linear jump system. So it's A theta X of T where theta is sampled from an IID probability distribution. So think of theta as being finite support. There are basically S values of A. At any given time, I pick one of these values. I evolve the system with A sub R, and then the system evolves, and then the new state, I sample again, and I evolve the system with a different A, okay? So in a full description of this dynamical system, I would know the dimension of the state space, I will know A1 up to AS. I will know the probability distribution of jumps for theta. And of course I have the rest of the system where the input is affecting the state by some matrix B, it's noisy. And then the output is some linear combination of the states. This is a simpler version of a general switched linear system where even the B and C matrices are also a function of theta. In this particular case, I made it simpler. The input affects the state the same way. The observation of the output is the same way. And I'm just basically um, uh, jumping the, uh, the transition matrix A, okay? So the system is fully described by this quadruple, if you like, the probability distribution P sub I on, that has support S, the set of AIs, the B and C matrix. 
Okay, so that's a, a full description of a system. And what we are trying to do is going back to the learning problem and say, from input output data, can we actually reconstruct the system? Okay, so that's the general problem. We'll get to the specifics in a minute. Now, in this particular talk, I am going to assume that not only I can measure inputs and outputs, but I can also measure the transition uh, theta sub i. So every time theta sub i uh, is picked from this s values of a, I know that this transition have occurred. Okay, this is a simplification, of course, in a general uh, system, you may not have this data, you may have to estimate that data, that adds another layer of complexity to the stochastic system. But in this talk, I'm gonna assume that theta i is measurable. So for measurable theta i, U i and Y i, how can I estimate the dynamical system described in this, in this page, okay? So that's kind of the general uh, description problem. I make some assumption, of course. Uh, the first simplifying assumption is just so that I can write down some expressions. I'm gonna assume theta jumps between only two variables, okay? So there's only gonna be one and two which means the transition probabilities are the transition uh, state matrix is either pick A1 or A2. It's a two dimensional linear system in this case. Inputs are single input, single output. So U is a, is a single input, B is a column matrix, Y is a, is a single output, which means C is a row, ma row matrix. And then A and W are uh, Gaussian noise that are uncorrelated, okay? Uh, we will make the assumption that this term is stable in a strong sense. That means that if you look at the um, response of the system, which is captured by um, any one of these sequences, if you actually, just for those people who are not familiar with these types of dynamical systems, if you look at the response of the system, what it looks like, it looks like, you know, convolution with terms that look like this, okay? It's C, A, L1 to K means that some sequence of, of products of A1, A2, A2, A1. You pick any sequence of linked K of uh, occurrences of, of indices one and two, and you construct the product of these matrices. That's A sub L1 to K, okay? Any possible combinations of that. It kind of looks like a, a evolution of hidden Markov model, okay? So you have that, and then you multiply by B. For stability of that system, we're gonna assume that the sum of the squares of these quantities is finite and it's bounded by quantity T beta, beta square. Beta square enters our error bounds, but beta square does not enter our algorithms. And so knowledge of beta square is not necessary to define the algorithms in a minute, but it does actually define the error bounds of this problem. Okay, you look at the soup over all possible sequences that way. So, where is the challenge in this particular problem? The first thing is that we are going to collect only noisy data. That's kind of obvious and no system identification problems with exact data, so that's easy, but it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. The important assumption here is that the, there's an, the, the number of states, the dimension of the state space is unknown for this particular problem. So while in fact you know that you're jumping between two states, and you, understand, and you can measure that. So I'm assuming that the jumps uh, are known, but I do not know the dimension of the state space. So I don't know in this, in, in this setting, the dimension of the latent variables, okay? So the latent variables are unknown. They could be arbitrarily high, which means that the system has very, very high memory, or could the system could be, have very low memory. There's no prior on that order, and then there is no distribution on that order. There's just no knowledge of that particular order. And of course, the final thing is that in state space, this parameterization tends to be non-convex in terms of the description of the C, the AIs, and the B, okay? So what we're trying to do is learn the system, and I would say the misspecification problem or the robustness problem has to tackle the question of this unknown hidden state unknown dimension of the latent variable. I would say if you have an upper bound, then you at least uh, uh, learn assuming that particular upper bound. It may be expensive, but at least mathematically, you, you would say I will learn for that upper bound. But here there is no upper bound, no, no knowledge of that particular state. So this is kind of the key issue for, for this learning problem. And it kind of applies the same way for the linear time invariant case with a little bit more complexity in this case of jump linear systems. Okay, 
So let me describe the data. The data is going to be a bunch of rollouts and, and samples. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna run multiple experiments. And the reason we will run multiple experiments is we wanna make sure that we are generating all the interesting sequences of, of products AI, AG. Okay, because what is happening, remember, as I did the simplification, that I only have two transitions, A1 and A2, at any given time. Either I sample A1 or sample A2. So I need to make sure that I get many of, as many of them as possible. So I'm going to run N sub S different experiments. Each experiment, I'm going to roll for N time. Okay, so the rollout time length is going to be n, the sample complexity, the number of experiments I'm going to run is ns, and the budget I have at the end of the day is ns times n. That's the time period that I have. This is the total length of the whole experiments that I have. Okay, so that's the data and the way it's generated. And of course, all the observations are going to be noisy because, as I said, the underlying assumption of the model is that it's disturbed by noisy data. So the outputs are going to be noisy, but I do have access to the experiment. So I know UI and I know YI, and I know uh, the, the jumps the, that the system goes through. So here's the high level story that, um, you know, coming back to me, this uh, comment about being a control theory. So here's the control theory piece of this problem, okay? So um, I have an M, which is a process. I don't know the dimension of the state space. I don't know the size of the latent variable. That means that if I have finite data, I cannot guarantee you that I can learn M. M can be much higher order than the dimension of the data. So right away, if I'm trying to come up with an algorithm that estimates M with, with small error, you know that that's not gonna be possible, okay? Not gonna be possible with robustness because M could have come, the data that I measured could have come from arbitrarily high dimensional system. That requires arbitrarily long data set. So with a finite set, I cannot do that, okay? But what can I do? If I cannot learn the actual system, what can I do? Well, I should be able to learn some lower dimensional approximation of M, okay? That some lower dimensional approximation, the, the, the dimension of that approximation should be driven from the data that I collected, okay? So the data should dictate a dimension R that says, learn an R-dimensional part of the system. So what does that mean from a control theory perspective? It means that you really have to learn, you really have to learn the best R-dimensional approximation of M. Okay, so let's say that there's a theoretical best lower dimensional approximation of, of, uh, of M, then what I need to do is learn that, estimate that part. Okay, so that's kind of the trick. Data should tell me some dimension R for which I can actually learn the best lower dimensional approximation of M, all right? Now, the nice thing about this in control theory for these classes of system is that the characterization of MR, if M was known, is actually possible and is done through a construct that known as the Hankel, Hankel matrix. And so the Hankel matrix of M captures all lower dimensional approximations of M, so in principle, what we need to do is approximate the Hankel matrix of M, find the R-dimensional approximation of the Hankel matrix, construct, construct the R-dimensional approximation of MR, and then see if that works, okay? So that's kind of the mental exercise. So I need to design a data-dependent estimator M hat of R as a of T, where R is really a function of T. The dimension of that approximation is a function of t. That's the crux of the argument. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna tell you what this Hankel matrix is, how I get a chat, and then, and then how, what, what bound that enables me to get in terms of how do I actually find R that would provide me with a guarantee of, for that system. And what I'm saying is that as you observe more and more data, those numbers may change. R depends on t, h hat depends on t, and then you continue to improve your estimation based on T, but for a given size of T, you may settle with a much lower dimensional approximation than the original system. Okay, 
What is the Hankel like matrix? The Hankel matrix or the Hankel like matrix? The Hankel matrix for linear time invariant system is easier than for the, uh, um, a switch linear system or a jump linear system. But basically, it looks like this it's a product of a, a column matrix times a row matrix. The column matrix is often referred to as the observability matrix. Okay, and it kind of have this particular form. It has C, which is the output matrix, and then C times all the possible sequences of possible occurrence of jumps. So you get A1 alone, you get A2 alone, you get A1 squared, you get A1, A2, you get A2, A1, and you continue to do that for arbitrarily length. It'd be then A1, A2, A1, A1, A2, A2, you know, and so forth. And you keep doing that, you can enumerate that lexicographic order and add, you know, and sort of um, uh, kind of tag it with a, an integer. So you do an, a, a, an ordering, lexicographic ordering, and you write this particular matrix called the observability matrix. So product of this observability matrix time another matrix called the reachability matrix, which looks like a transpose of the other one and basically maps the input to the state. So you got an input to the state, state to the output, and that's the Hankel matrix, okay? This is now a theory about model reduction, and it says that you can construct this Hankel matrix if you knew the actual parameters of the system. They're all scaled, by the way, by the probabilities of the occurrence of, of that particular A sub i. Okay, so if you have A1, you multiply by square root of P1. If you have A1, A2, you multiply by the square root of P1 times P2. Okay, so that's how you construct a matrix from the theoretical description, from the, from the exact description of a process. You can also shift it by one or by two, depending whether you want to shift it by A1 and A2 by multiplying by that particular matrix. I'm going to cut a long story short, and I tell you there's a theory behind how this Hankel matrix connects to two things. One is the minimal realization of that particular stochastic process, and two, an approximation of that stochastic process. And the way it works is basically doing a, Hankel, a singular value decomposition of the Hankel matrix. There's a nice property with this Hankel matrix that no matter how complicated the system, it always has finite rank, okay? And the rank of that matrix is exactly equal to the dimension of the latent variables. So what is the, the, really, the, the reason the Hankel is interesting is that it is capturing in it a statistic that will estimate the rank of the underlying system. But more strongly, so, so the first thing is that the minimal realization is obtained by doing a, a singular value decomposition of this particular matrix. But actually, one can do more and say by taking only the top singular values of the Hankel matrix, you obtain lower dimensional approximations of the original system. It's easy to see that you can approximate the Hankel matrix. What is not obvious is that in the approximate Hankel matrix, there corresponds a dynamical, a stochastic dynamical system of order K that actually approximate the original system. This is a very strong result in control theory, which is out, out of the context of this talk over here. So my program is really simple. I'm gonna use the data to estimate edge. I cannot estimate all of edge because it's an infinite matrix. I'm gonna to have to estimate a block of edge. And then from the singular value decomposition of edge, I'm gonna prove all the results that I have, okay? And the point is I'm gonna be able to do everything with, with time varying, with, with time dependent blocks, okay? I cannot learn all the matrix. I know it has finite rank, but I don't know the rank. So I cannot look for it. It could grow with the, as the data grows. Um, and so I, I need to construct an estimate. So one particular way, and I begin, this is maybe a lot of knowledge of uh, model reduction and control theory, uh, a Hankel matrix is described in terms of the mapping between past input to future outputs. So there is a very quick way using the data to estimate the parameters of the Hankel matrix because it has, it has that mapping from past inputs to future outputs, but I can align the inputs and outputs in such a way that I can estimate the parameters of the Hankel matrix. So, so I do that. The interesting question for us is how do I pick the size of the, Hankel, of, the, of the Hankel block? How do I pick N in the Hankel block? If I picked N, then the, I will get an estimate H hat of N. It has a block size N. And that should compare to the infinite Hankel matrix, which I don't know. 
And if I use the triangle inequality, that gives me two pieces. Hn, okay, is, is um, I, can, I can add and subtract the act, actual truncation of n dimension of h infinity. And then what I have is the following. My estimate should be approximating the actual truncated hn of the original Hankel matrix. And what's left should be a truncation error. The truncation error is what I did not know. And this error is the, uh, the estimation error based on the data that I got. So what I'm trying to do is actually provide a probabilistic bound for both of these quantities. This one I can estimate from the data, and this one I can force based on how I pick n and the upper bound on the, on the total norm of my process. So two things I will tell you about, and I know I'm, I'm getting close to running out of time. The first thing is that, how do you pick the size of the Hankel matrix? That means, how do you pick, how do you pick, um, uh, so the size of the Hankel matrix is, is very closely related to how many sequences of A sub I occurred, okay? So that means that as I'm looking at it, you know, um, I'm looking at the data and I'm measuring theta sub I, right? I'm looking at, um, if I look at sequences of, of length five, how many, so, so that means that I, any possible uh, combination of length five could have happened, I want any, any combination of those to have occurred multiple times. If it only occurred once, then my learning algorithm is not gonna do very well. So I need uh, the, the kth order, the number of kth order sequences that occur to be larger than a certain threshold. That is, I have richness in the data. So sequences say A1, A2, or A2, A1, these are sequences of length two occur at least five times, you know? So the threshold is defining that. The threshold is only a function of a constant C, okay? And what I will pick N to be, to be the smallest K, the smallest length, that, such that the sequences of that length occur higher than a threshold. That means that I have some confidence in my estimation algorithm. And if I did that, I can then go to my regression. I estimate my Hankel matrix with dimension two and UP, upper bound. And then what I do is I'll do a thresholding of this particular um, uh, Hankel matrix that I estimated over here from the regression. I will threshold it through also a data dependent bound, okay? And to estimate what the order of the dynamical system I want to pick. So what I'll do is I'll say, look, okay, I have a threshold. For a second, let's just get, think of that as a constant. I'm gonna look at the Lth singular value divided by the first singular value to be larger than the threshold. As L increases, this quantity decreases and this bound may not occur, okay? So at some point, L will stop and I will take the largest L for which the L divided by sigma one is larger than the threshold. And I would say, that's R. That's my data-driven dimension of the system that I would need to estimate to guarantee uh, a reasonable bound on my error. So I pick that based on this quantity and I get this particular guarantee with high probability. And the guarantee with high probability says that all the parameters, in this case, my C and, and, and B were constant, so this is irrelevant in this talk, but my A1 is approximated by A1 hat and A2 is approximated by A2 hat. And these approximations I will get to be as close as sigma one divided by sigma L of the estimated Hankel matrix times an error that decays as one over the fourth root of NS. Remember, NS is the number of experiments is the sample complexity. So the number of experiments increase, I decrease this error by a fraction of one over root NS, but the bound is multiplied by how well my data is, which is a time dependent bound over here. Of course, you can look at the asymptotic results and everything works well, but this is a finite data result, okay? So that's kind of in a nutshell what you what, what this result is, is, is about. It really allows you to say, uh, in principle, start with your approximate Hankels, find an upper bound on what the size of the Hankel that you want to approximate is from the data, okay? Do a thresholding th through singular value decomposition and then and estimate a truncated lower dimensional system. That's really the, the algorithm. The point of this is that you can actually, so the, the, the interesting aspect of this is that all of these bonds 
are derived from the data itself, okay? And so, of course, they may not be great, but that's what the data has given you. But it always tells you that there is always a lower dimensional system that does really well, at least in estimating the, the best lower dimensional approximation of the original system, okay? And here's just a quick example where, just to show kind of why this happens. So this is basically what we refer to as a finite impulse response system. It's, um, you know, the C and B were picked randomly and I have a decaying system of rho to the power k, okay? But otherwise there's uh, the impulse response of the system is zero above 150. So this is a finite impulse response system. And this example shows you that if you follow this particular algorithm, you find out that you know, the, uh, a system of dimension four turns out to do so much better than a, a system of dimension 16, you know, that the Hankel matrix actually settles into a very low dimensional problem for that size of data, which in this particular case, 50,000 50, data points for this example. They use 50,000 data points and stop, there's no asymptotics in that, then the best order model does is probably four, you can argue, okay, eight is also doing really well because it's kind of ultimately drops below a certain value. But the point is that if you increase the data points, you're, you're in this range over here. While for example, a 16th order system, which is, you know, the original process is 150 order system, but a fourth order system is giving us the best approximation of that process. So this, the, the algorithm naturally picks the best lower dimensional approximation. So how does this relate to the reinforcement learning? It's really interesting in that um, the way you want to think about this is that suppose the underlying dynamical system is very high dimension, it's unstructured, and no knowledge of the parameterization of M, but you're wrapping a control strategy around it. And every time the control strategy is optimized to minimize a certain cost function, right? But the point is, what you would do at every step is you will, will do a similar thing that I did before, which is um, split the error into an estimation error and a truncation error, okay? And give a bound on the truncation error. And if that bound exceeds a certain threshold, you may want to increase the dimension of R, okay? So R in this reinforcement learning now is not fixed, but rather moves up with the data. So there's a um, a data varying dimension of the underlying system for which you do the sort of the, the, the redesign of the control. Then as you have the new experiment, you re-estimate R and you continue the process. And this is ongoing work that we, we have right now uh, trying to make this work for the reinforcement learning problem. So um, with that, I, I stop here because I know that I've, I've already exceeded my time. And thank you for the attention. Thank you, Mozart, very nice talk. I think Nanjiang has a question. Nan, can you can you speak? Yeah, hi, uh, Master. Thanks for the uh, great talk. So I just want to uh, mention that. Uh, uh, so in RL, people have looked at uh, very similar algorithms, but for discrete observation, discrete action, partially observable systems, where we also use spectral learning for, uh, you know, building on observable Hankel matrices. And people also in the last past few years have been looking at how to you know, do low rank approximations of them. And uh, one interesting thing I'm thinking from there is that uh, there's some interesting result that says that you can afford to use as large Hankel matrices as possible, uh, even if the entries for very long sequences that you're estimating extremely poorly. But if you look at how you recover the spectrum properties of the entire matrix, it, it has some dimension free properties. And we also observed that in, you know, empirically in practice. So I was just curious if something similar could happen for linear dynamical systems as well, where your concentration bounds wouldn't need to, you know, depend on any form of like the size of the tentacle. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. So if that, I mean, I've, I've seen quite a bit of that work, but if there's more, please send me some references and would love to take a look in more detail. So I think you're right, actually, in the linear time invariant system, I could ignore the, the, the definition of N sub U, which I, I you know, and, and keep the Hankel matrix arbitrarily high, arbitrarily high, and then do the thresholding correctly because the thresholding gets rid of some of the stuff, right? So for the bounds, to prove the bounds, we need a U. In practice, I can just do it and, and threshold and I get the same results, 
but you know, so you know, I would still have to say that I can guarantee you as much as this error. So I do that counting for the bomb, but I don't need it for the algorithm. You see what I'm saying? So you know, I mean, you're right. I can just estimate the largest possible Heinkel matrix I have, and some of the tail stuff is out there, and I can get rid of it in in these in the thresholding process. But the thresholding depends on my n sub u. You see what I'm saying? So it depends on that on that particular estimate. It's a great yeah, question. Thanks. And uh, I've already put one reference in the chat. I'll put a few more. Um, okay, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. And so I have a question. So yeah. uh, for accurately uh, estimating a long run approximation to the Hanker matrix, we, we will need some assumption on the data, right? The data should cover enough about the state space. So would there be some bad examples in which, for example, there are certain state that, are, that, that happen to be hard to reach, but we have to collect information from those states to estimate the low rank matrix as well. So uh, in that case, uh, is there, would that cause an issue for the algorithm? And is there anything to get around with it? So the algorithm is not tuned to beta. It doesn't care about beta. The bound depends on beta. Right, so data is is the 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 bound on the on the say on the input output mapping, mm -hmm. right? So kind of like think of it as the total gain of the system. So beta enters the bounds, but it doesn't you know it's not tuned to the algorithm. So of course, if I want to improve on that beta, I may have if beta was very very high, of course, then the bounds are really bad, and so I need to do more. But what is interesting, Mengdi, is that because I am capturing the best lower dimensional approximation, if there are states in that system that are there, but they don't contribute a lot to the gain, I'll just ignore them. Because they, the lower dimensional approximation in that system also ignores them if they don't contribute large. If they contribute high values to beta, then they would be captured in the my, my first singular values of the, of the system. So that's why I'm saying that Mapping, connecting this model reduction story to the approximation story through is really critical because it finds the, dimension, the directions that are the most important for you through the Hankel matrix. Mm -hmm. We could have just done any basis approximation, but this is nicer because it guarantees that what you get is the best input output approximation of the system. So it kind of naturally sorts out through the, high, the, the, the most impactful, impactful states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, I think partially, yeah. Thank you. So uh, we might have more questions, but we have to defer those to the break. So you can stay for a bit longer. Sure, no problem. Okay. So, um, so Bengti, I think I'm introducing Alex, is that right? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs>